Well, hi, everyone. Uh, it's so great to be here with all of you. Uh, my name is Ben Allen, and I'm, I'm uh, proud to represent the 26th Senate District, which includes the Hollywood, Westside, and Coastal South Bay communities of Los Angeles County in our, uh, uh, our state Senate. And we're taking this opportunity today to talk a little about wildfires. Uh, you know, we're here today entering into the hottest and driest time of the year in Southern California. Uh, and, and this is an opportunity for us to talk about an issue that is increasingly becoming an issue of life and death uh, in our state. And I remember, you know, as a kid, when there was a wildfire up in the Santa Monica Mountains, and I grew up in Santa Monica, and we would go down. I remember, I remember very distinctly what a unique experience that was and how we went to literally go watch the flames. And we took people in, friends of ours who could come down from Malibu. Uh, this was sort of a once in once in a 30 year, once in a 20 year event. And now, unfortunately, it's almost becoming an annual event. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's become a question, you know, for those of us who live in the hillside communities that, that I represent, a question of if, you know, of not, not of if, but of, of when. And so uh, I'm just hopeful that, that today's webinar will give folks an opportunity to answer questions about how to keep your family safe, some of the challenges associated with wildfire, some of the things that you should be thinking about uh, from home hardening to insurance. And, and uh, it's also an opportunity for you to get some questions answered of uh, uh, our friends from CAL FIRE uh, who you know, devoted their lives to trying to protect our communities uh, against what are increasingly fero more ferocious and dangerous wildfires as climate change becomes more and more uh, dug in in our state. Anyway, it's no secret that we're at a dire point when it comes to the future of wildfires in California. Fires are burning larger, more frequently, more intensely than ever before. Uh, this is a direct result, as we know, of climate change, which is causing hotter temperatures and more severe drought, uh, including our current 20-year mega drought, which is estimated to be the worst in California uh, in over 1,200 years, just to give you a sense of how ahistorical this is. And the situation is now only being exacerbated by decades of fire suppression that have disrupted the natural role that fire plays in California's wildland ecosystems and unchecked development that goes deeper and deeper into the wildlands. And then of course, we've got power lines that, uh, that service those developments that go deeper and deeper into the wildlands. And those power lines are oftentimes the source of, uh, of, of fires. Uh, now, as you can see on, on the graph on your screen, the average number of acres burned per year is growing exponentially. In fact, the 2018, 2020, and 2021 fire seasons are currently the three most destructive fire seasons on record in California. And those records go all the way back uh, uh, to the 19th century, but even before, because they've been able to study fire records off of tree rings. Uh, so, so, so in all of California history, we've got the three most uh, destructive fire seasons on record uh, uh, over the last four years, 2018, 2020, 2020 uh, and 2021. Um, and th those, those three fire seasons burned more than 9 million acres in total. Uh, 40,000 structures were destroyed statewide, $50 billion in property damage and firefighting costs. So this, we're really bearing a cost, not only as individuals, but also as a society, as we all pay into uh, the, the collective costs associated with firefighting and our insurance and everything else. Now, of course, I've seen these troubling trends uh, close to my home in, in the district, as I, I, I mentioned. Um, you, you know, uh, most notably, just, just recently, 2019 and 2021, we had the Getty and Palisades fires that burned several thousand acres. They destroyed dozens of homes, forced thousands to evacuate. I got to go to the, the fire uh, center where all the, the hardworking folks from Cal Fire, folks who'd been brought in from all over the state, and of course, LA County, were working so hard to fight those fires. Uh, and there's really so much hard work that goes into that, uh, that effort, a hard work and coordination. Uh, but so much destruction and, and um, depressing to see. And, and it's one of the many things that motivated me to do this, this uh, webinar today. And we know this problem isn't going to go away. Uh, we know that this problem necessitates our continued attention in the coming years. But before we talk about what you can do to stay safe from future wildfires, I do want to take just a moment to share some of the work that's been happening in this space in Sacramento. Uh, last year, I introduced SB 45, which was a bond measure that would have asked uh, voters to approve a $5.5 billion investment in California's climate resiliency, uh, including uh, in the wildfire space, a lot of fire, fire work uh, to help make us more resilient to these inevitable 
uh, uh, challenges that are being raised as a, because of, of, of climate change in the, in the wildfire space. Uh, this was the proposal, but of course, with the back-to-back -back years of record-breaking surplus, we were then able to, to get uh, the, the key portions of the bond funded by the budget, so we don't have to uh, borrow. Uh, and, 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 and that's really fantastic. I mean, last year's budget included a $15 billion climate resiliency package for the state. Fiscal year 2022-2023 was just signed into law by Governor Newsom, and it includes $21 billion to mitigate the impacts of climate disasters, such as wildfire and droughts. And this funds uh, things like better managing our open space to ensure that when fires do break out, we can reduce the severity and, and, and prevent them from entering urban areas. Uh, there's funding to, uh, for se securing the, the wildland urban interface and improving forest health in more remote areas where, where tree mortality has caused real concerns for, for catastrophic fires. There's also funding for upgrading firefighting equipment that our firefighters use to make sure we're putting our best foot forward and containing uh, fires as effectively as possible. And so it's our, it's our strong hope that not only will these uh, investments save lives and, and, and homes, uh, you know, it, it also will save money. I mean, for every dollar that we invest in wildfire prevention on the front end, we've estimated that the state saves $6 in costs associated with firefighting and cleanup because it's so expensive once the, the, the wildfire uh, is off and raging. Now, that being said, we're here today because no matter how much we might invest in prevention, wildfires will continue to threaten communities as the temperatures rise and drought conditions persist. So to talk about strategies and resources to keep yourself, your family, and your home as safe as possible, I, I just wanna ask you to join me in welcoming Stephen Hawks, who's Assistant Deputy Director of Community Wildfire Preparedness and Mitigation, uh, Fire Engineering and Investigations and Support Services for CAL FIRE's Office of the State Fire Marshal. Uh, Stephen uh, is, a, is, a, is a critical leader for our state's uh, firefighting efforts, and we're just uh, happy to welcome him here today. Yeah, thank you, Senator. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I'm going to share my screen. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, again, uh, Steve Hawks with Cal Fire Office of the State Fire Marshal, and um, presentation today is on um, the home loss, basically. How can we um, prepare our homes um, with defensible space and uh, home retrofitting efforts to um, give the home um, and us the best chance of surviving a wildfire. So um, what I'd like to do is back up a couple slides here. Sorry about the, that. But um, first off, um, what I'd like to talk about is the different ways that homes are exposed to a wildfire. And uh, there's three different ways. The first and, and largest exposure occurs from embers, and that's um, fire brands that the um, fire, when it burns uh, vegetative material, that material becomes light enough and gets lofted into the air and then carried by the wind and deposited down downwind. And sometimes it's deposited on homes, unfortunately. Um, and so the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety it estimated that about 60 and maybe upwards of 90% of home destruction or home loss occurs because of embers. So a significant issue. Uh, the next reason is uh, direct flame contact, and that's uh, fire burning directly from the wildland area through different paths. And you can see the vegetation in the middle of the screen, but on the picture on the right, um, it could be used that fence or the tree next to the fence um, to catch that structure on fire, which was this picture was taken on the campfire in paradise. And then the last method is through radiant heat, and that's um, large enough accumulation of fuel burning close enough to the structure for a long enough period of time to ignite something combustible on the structure itself. Um, <clears throat> so moving on to the next um, slide here, I have a short video conducted at uh, IBHS's or the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety's laboratory in South Carolina. And you see on the screen a duplex and the right side of the duplex is um, uh, constructed of non-combustible materials. So cement, fiberboard, siding, dual pane windows, and has a um, zero to five foot zone surrounding the home that is non-combustible of gravel. On the left-hand side, you see the exact opposite, a home built with a wood shingle siding um, and combustible material wood bark mulch within that zero to five foot zone. So I'm going to play this short video here. Hopefully it'll play. Oops. This looks like it's wanting to start, but it's not. 
There we go. So you see the embers being cast in their facility uh, down um, by some big um, wind turbines that they have casting the embers on the structure. The embers catch the wood bark mulch on fire, um, which extends underneath the deck in front of the house on the left hand side that catches that deck on fire. And then as the wind um, causes that fire and the wood bark mulch to wrap around that left side of the house. It extends that fire up the side of the house, gets up underneath the eaves, and, um, and then eventually makes its way in through the vent into the house, and it breaks out that window that you see there on the left-hand side. Um, so you, you, this is really a good visual demonstration of the importance of um, retrofitting the structure or building the structure the first time around to a, a really good standard, um, and then the defensible space. So the two combined give the home the best chance of surviving. And CAL FIRE has a damage inspection program, and we've also had the uh, ability to work with other entities like the National Institute of Standards and Technology and doing some post-fire analysis on various fires, including the campfire. And through this, we've determined that, um, that really it's the whole surrounding. It's not just everything that's on your property or your parcel that's impactful to your structure, it's your neighboring parcels. Um, particularly if the homes are in uh, high density housing or medium density housing. And um, we know that reducing the amount of com combustible materials on a parcel obviously makes a different, less difference, you know, less uh, materials on the parcel to burn, the less exposure that the house will, will encounter. Um, and during these large uh, fires that become destructive, there's typically a, a significant amount of wind associated with them. And so we need to do all that we can do to harden the structure. Um, we can't do, just pick and choose from a list and expect that during these significant events that we've driven down the risk to our structures. Um, so we really need to do the full gamut of things. And then a, accumulation of fuels, particularly in close proximity to each other, really makes a difference and increases the um, exposure, exposure to a structure. Um, also, um, we talked about embers and fire um, previously. We need to harden all of our structures to both exposures. And I'll talk about more about that in just a little bit. Um, NIST data shows that if a structure catches fire and it is um, the fires put out and uh, receives some damage, um, that it was put out because there's emergency response personnel there. So it really underscores the effectiveness of our firefighting resources of defending structures and making a difference. Um, and then also from our, our damage inspection data, we've determined that when a house catches fire though, it, it is 90 to 95% likely that it will be completely destroyed. And 70% of our damage inspection database is comprised of residential structures. So it just really underscores the importance that we need to do everything we can to prevent structures from catching fire in the first place. And so um, what we do uh, is we look at this uh, through a couple different things. I and mean, you'll see a red dial and a blue dial on the screen. And um, on the left-hand side, you'll see like uh, wildland vegetation. Um, and then if the fire was to start out there and burn towards the, towards the right um, into the uh, wildland urban intermix, and interface um, and, and encounter structures, um, what do we do to defend our structures? And we look at these two dials. The red dial is the, all the things that surround a structure in those kind of uh, golden boxes. And what can we do to either remove them, reduce the amount of fuel that we have around our structures or relocate them potentially a distance away that, that makes them less of a hazard. And we start there with the things that surround the structure by moving them, reducing them, or relocating them. And after we've done all we can do in that area, then we focus on the structure and we harden the structure or retrofit it with more non-combustible uh, materials to make it more um, resilient to the effects of a wildfire. And so we have a couple different um, things that we have in our toolbox uh, to be able to do that. We have in our California Building Code, we have Chapter 7A, which uh, came into effect in July 1, 2008. So all new structures built in 
um, the state in various locations. Um, uh, down here where it says required, where required in what we call the state responsibility area um, in all of that, which is 31 million acres across the state. It's also in the local responsibility area, what is known as the very high fire hazard severity zones. Um, it's required in there, which is roughly a million acres. And then uh, land designated by the local jurisdiction. So um, potentially a county or a city um, where they, they believe that the, uh, the code should also apply. And we also had Senate Bill um, 63 um, from Senator Stern that passed last year um, that is in effect now and requires CAL FIRE to map the high and moderate fire hazard severity zones in the local responsibility area, and which means that um, the, the Chapter 7A will also apply in the high fire hazard severity zone and as the language in the bill states, potentially in the moderate zone. That's still to be de determined. But Chapter 7A is the minimum state standard that uh, homes that are in, in essence, wildfire prone areas need to be built to. Local jurisdictions can always pass an ordinance that is more stringent than the state's minimum standard, but not less stringent. Um, the second thing I talked about uh, when we talk about home loss is defensible space. And it is um, depending on the jurisdiction, but in the, um, the state's code, it's 100 feet of fuel modification around a home. And you can see the different um, codes that I put up there as to which code is applicable to certain areas um, throughout the state. But um, currently there are only two zones for defensible space, zero to 30 feet and 30 to 100 feet. Um, Assembly Bill 3074 from uh, Assembly Member Friedman a couple years ago passed and requires the Board of Forestry to develop the zero to five foot ember resistant zone. So the first five feet around a house as well as decks that are attached to a house. And why five feet? That's the bottom picture here. Um, you can see this is IBHS's lab again in South Carolina. They're casting these embers and you can see the embers kind of bending and following right along the house. And then they come out from the house and then follow another line. And that line is about five feet out from the house. So that's how the zero to five foot zone was determined. And it is really um, through research uh, been shown to be the most critical zone for defensible space. That new standard though is being developed currently by the Board of Forestry. So we don't know exactly what that will entail um, until that regulatory process is completed. But defensible space in general involves um, removing fuels, especially dead and material around your property, um, separating fuels, uh, limbing up uh, trees and maintenance of everything, keeping it in a good healthy state. And in drought conditions like we're currently in, uh, we may need to remove um, some items that we can no longer keep in a good healthy state. So we also have a new program um, because we have a, a large number, the vast majority, maybe upwards of 90% of the structures that are in California were built prior to chapter 7A coming into existence. So we have a new retrofit uh, program that is a joint effort between Cal OES and Cal Fire to build a statewide framework from which a local entity like a county or a city um, or other entity could pick up the framework of this program with state backing from Cal OES and Cal Fire and implement it at the local level to retrofit homes um, that are more vulnerable to structure or to vegetation fire um, up to a better state. And so that program is, is underway and we're, we're starting the pilot, um, three pilot uh, test areas in San Diego, Shasta and Lake Counties. We also have created a retrofit list um, from another bill, AB 2911, from a few years back. Um, and we tasked our, um, our Chapter 7A working group, which is a standing working group, to develop this list of low-cost retrofits. And you see it uh, here. Um, and the link on this, the screen, um, we, we have this list available on our readyforwildfire.org uh, website. Um, but it's a list of uh, what we determined to be low cost items. And many of them are DIY type um, projects that you could undertake to help um, 
increase the resiliency of your house. We've also, um, through the home hardening program that I just mentioned with Cal OES, uh, developed a very comprehensive um, list of retrofits. And it ranges from, you know, very expensive from replacing the entire roof um, when, when it doesn't necessarily need to be replaced uh, because it's still in a good condition, but maybe not fire resilient. Um, all the way down to you know low cost items, but it really looks at everything from the roof line to the ground, um, as well as looking at ember exposure and fire exposure, and that we call that the hazard mitigation methodology. And um, it was published a couple months back by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And then lastly, um, here we have developed a um, home retrofit guide. Um, this was a, one, a grant that um, an entity in, um, uh, it was called Tahoe Living with Fire, um, received from our wildfire prevention grants and brought a, together a group of folks to develop this uh, wildfire home retrofit guide. And it's a really good guide at stepping you through the roof, the eaves, vents, uh, siding windows, so forth, with good pictures of what to do about um, different things around your house, the external components, and how to retrofit them to make your home more resilient. Also, um, one question we routinely get is um, the cost of building a house to Chapter 7a versus not. And so there's two studies that were conducted by the um, Headwaters Economics in coordination with the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. The one on the, um, the, the right or the um, was produced in November 2018 back in Montana, so not necessarily exactly representative of California, but it looked at a home um, built um, to the uh, International Wildland Urban Interface Code uh, versus a home not built to that standard and determined that there was negligible difference in cost between the two. And then here just recently, um, last month, they produced another study that is specific to California, looking at a home in Redding area and then one in Los Angeles and, and three different uh, criteria for building the home to a baseline home, an enhanced home, and an optimum, optimum home and determine the difference of um, cost between them. So uh, the baseline home was built to chapter 7A and the enhanced home had a little bit of extra features um, and so forth. So between the baseline and enhanced home, there's only a $3,000 difference. And then going up to the optimum, which is the, really the built to the highest standard um, was $18,000 added cost in Reading and 27,000 in Los Angeles area. And then um, uh, two more slides here. Um, so we need to do everything we can do to prepare our homes prior to the fire starting. But once the fire starts, then we need to be prepared to evacuate. Um, and so having a, a wildfire action plan um, with all these things that are listed here, putting together a go bag with all your important papers, photographs, um, things that you have um, that you can't replace if your house catches fire, need to be packed up and ready to go. And then creating a communication plan. Um, and then lastly, once it's time to evacuate, evacuate now. Um, these fires today, this fire environment is so critical that uh, you may not have the amount of time to evacuate that you think you have. So when it's time to go, please leave. Um, it's going to give you the best chance of getting out of the fire area safely. It's going to give the firefighters the best chance of getting into the fire area and um, working directly on the fire. So please get out. Um, heed the, the um, evacuation orders that are coming from the local fire and law enforcement. And uh, by, by all means, if you haven't been told to evacuate, if you feel threatened by the fire, go ahead and evacuate. It's better to be safe, get out of the fire area than to stay. And we've seen a number of instances most recently here on the McKinney fire in Northern California and Siskiyou County of people perishing um, in the fire. So please get out and please do it safely. Um, Senator, um, that's the end of my presentation. Back to you. Well, thank you. I really appreciate all the, all the great information, Steve. Um, 
and I've, I've been, there's a couple, uh, you know, questions in the, in the chat that I, you know, take a look at and, and, um, and then we'll be asking some more, uh, but let's, 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 let's switch gears to Mike. Uh, and then we can all do a, a presentation, sorry, do a question and answer series afterwards. So, so Steve was focused on what individuals can do to protect themselves from wildfires. Uh, and Mike's talking a bit more about what we can do at the community level. Uh, so Mike Wilson is the regional coordinator for the California Fire Safe Council, which is our state's leading nonprofit organization that's dedicated to wildfire preparedness. Let's 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 hand it over to you, Mike. Thank you, Senator. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to be here today and an opportunity to speak with uh, community members and and to talk about this important subject. Uh, being a community member, um, after after spending 35 years in the fire service, getting back involved and being part of the solution, uh, joining the California Fire Safe Council, I saw the opportunity to really be able to uh, look at what are what are solutions based at community level. And being able to uh, work as a community member, what can I do or what can you do as a community member to make your home safer and your community safer? So I'd like to talk a little about that today. As uh, Chief uh, Hawks mentioned, the, the you know uh, fire happening up in Siskiyou County and the McKinney fire, you know, I, I'm, I'm fortunate that I, I have a son who's uh, operating an engine up there on, uh, on the fire. And I, I fear, though, that he sees fire behavior these days that I never had the opportunity to see in my career because it's become uh, quite significantly, uh, you know, more advanced and we're seeing different uh, levels of fire behavior. So as a as a father and as a community member, I urge community members to get involved. Uh, when it comes to wildfire, I think that's it's really, really critical to understand that uh, no single person can can protect a community. However, uh, residents joining forces can can create a local fire safe council to effectively reduce uh, and prevent wildfire losses in your community. And uh, fire safe councils, and as an example, are grassroots community led organizations that mobilize residents to protect their homes, communities, and their environments from catastrophic wildfires. As a local fire safe council uh, is often sparked by a catalyst, perhaps a recent wildfire, I, I'm excited to see this one sparked by Senator Allen and his you know, desire to see your community uh, become a much safer community. So again, pulling together and becoming what you can be as, as a group working together uh, to uh, embrace your community and the uh, a, a commitment to really make your community safer. So moving farther into, into this, I'll, I'll, I'll answer some questions and ask some questions, and we'll be able to come back to this in the end a little bit, but why does your community need a uh, fire safe council? Well, fire here in California, we live in fire, we live on the lake, and uh, we, we have to realize that a fire is part of the ecosystem. Our, our you know, forests that we live around and we, we are, are surrounded by are, are really kind of uh, driven by fire. So thinking about how fire thins the vegetation or it, you know, cracks seeds to, to replenish uh, the, the existing uh, vegetation that's there and replenish the soil that allows the forest to survive. So we, we have to learn to live in it, but, but how do we do that? Um, we, we have to think about safety and really keeping our communities and our homes safe as Chief Hawks had mentioned. Uh, mobilizing people in the community who stand to lose something of value and uh, creating a, a powerful group initiative and saving lives and property and money for, for the, the community and, and the, the fires. As, as the Senator mentioned, you know, we spend a great deal on fire suppression. So what can we do to basically lessen those, those expenses? It's, it's doing these basic things, coming together as a fire safe council here in California, a great opportunity for you as, as community members and in doing that, you become a voice that can communicate with the government agencies, with your political leaders. Um, a fire safe council is a coalition of public and private sector organizations that share a common vested interest in wildfire prevention and loss mitigation. Councils are dedicated to saving lives and reducing fire losses by making their communities fire safe. In doing that, who should be involved? Well, it's our local fire agencies. It's partnering with your local fire department and fire agencies in your community. Cal Fire, your local fire department, uh, LA County Fire, LA City Fire, utility uh, groups within your organization. We do work closely at the California Fire Safe Council with uh, uh, Southern California Edison 
and they provide S grant funding to pass that on to our communities to try to work on again fire prevention and mitigation uh, situations. So those those are people we want to get involved. Environmental groups who are concerned about the habitat loss and endangered species when fires occur, as well as a number of fire related issues. And they are also part of that ecosystem uh, driven factor of understanding that fire does exist and we have to be able to live in and around that. The insurance industry. Uh, we work closely with and local fire safe councils can work closely with re uh, representatives from the different uh, insurance industry and insurance companies to really look at what can be done as, as Chief Hawks mentioned, the organization that, that it works in, in doing the science behind how do we make our community safer is, is uh, you know, a good part of that local landscapers who are uh, really kind of knowledgeable about plants and what can be planted around those homes, not in the zero to five zone or the zero zone in that first five feet, but as you move out, what kind of plants are less, uh, you know, we call it fire resilient and are able to basically withstand fire and not burn up and, and create a, a bigger hazard to the structure. Real estate agents within your communities. You know, those are the folks that are really kind of needing to ensure that they're they're working with the homeowners for both selling and buying to create uh, safe homes and, and safe communities. Um, your park and recreation departments and uh, as, as well as your local community uh, and political leaders that are that are out there. And that goes to your local city council members, your, your county board of supervisors, and your elected officials like Senator Allen, who are out there doing this work and getting out there to really push the message out to make sure our communities are safe. So talking about what a fire safe council can do, one of the things that the California Fire Safe Council works on is being a, a pass-through agency or a grants clearinghouse. So we often take federal, state, and private funding, and we pass that down to the local level for different projects that can be created through uh, fire safe councils in your community. That can be fuel reduction projects. Oftentimes it's fuel breaks or shaded fuel breaks that makes our community safer and really uh, you know, puts, puts something in that firefighters can make a stand on when they're battling the, the wildfires in your community. Escape routes, extremely important. I love live up in Northern California. I live in Butte County, so near Paradise, where the campfire, unfortunately, years back, uh, destroyed a community, took several lives, and took several homes. Those escape routes were always a discussion point, but it was obvious during that fire of how important escape routes are because it was something that, after the fact, we can evaluate and determine we need to really explore those escape route options. Infrastructure improvement. Making sure that your bridges, your, your roadways have uh, the ability to access fire equipment coming into your communities. Oftentimes in, in some of the more rural communities, there are bridges that go into properties that don't have the capacity to hold up a fire engine and ensuring that you can actually work with community fire safe groups to uh, look at infrastructure improvements. It's very, very important. Establishing water sources, including uh, above ground tanks, and different water sources for fire suppression equipment coming into your community to battle water, water, uh, wildfires. Address signs, making sure that each and every address in your community can be identified in the event of not only a wildfire, but any other maybe medical emergency where you wanna make sure first responders can find you and find your loved one when, when that uh, important event happens. Educational programs, both youth and adult. We focus a lot on now on our youth education programs because children are growing up in, in these times of fire and they're seeing devastating wildfires. So knowing that our, our youth are able to uh, work through that, both uh, post-fire and pre-fire, we, we think that that's an important thing to in, invest in in our communities. And again, as a local fire safe council, you can work with funds to get those kind of programs started. As mentioned you know, previously by Chief Hawks, home assessments, um, we, we work with uh, getting some of our community members trained to get out there to augment the existing uh, fire assessments that are done both through CAL FIRE and your local fire department's prevention programs to look at the home hardening and defensible space around your homes. Other uh, projects and funding available include GIS mapping technology, getting that technology available to make sure your community and your, your homes are safe. And then as, as 
fully mentioned by Chief Hawks, the home hardening defensible space. It's working with getting those funds to the communities to see if we can help people, you know, sometimes our older community or, or folks who, who don't have the funds available to make their homes safe. And that's that's absolutely a priority. Our, a lot of our information or resources, including uh, handouts and flyers in regards to defensible space, home hardening, and surviving wildfire, can be located on our uh, California Fire Safe Council website. As you'll notice on the screen, we're at uh, cafiresafecouncil.org. Please check out our website. Look at the different uh, resources we have available. We have access to our staff members. Your local Southern California Regional Coordinator is Brittany, Brittany Munoz. She's actually on this uh, uh, presentation today as a, as a spectator, but please reach out to Brittany and talk about uh, with her how you can start a fire safe council in your community. And with that, um, I'll be happy to take questions at the end here, but please feel free to reach out to us through our website and through the information that will be provided to you. And again, uh, thank you, Senator. Thank you, community members. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Well, thanks, Mike. I really appreciate all that great information. And uh, maybe Davis, uh, who's been very ably posting all sorts of helpful links and information into the chat can, can post that link from the Fire Safe Council too, so people can can be able to um, directly access it. All right, um, I'm so we got a whole we had a whole bunch of uh, of questions that were submitted by folks in advance of tonight's webinar. Um, I will say that a number of them um, uh, have been addressed uh, to, to one extent or another. But uh, you know, one thing that's been repeated a couple of times, Sarah from Los Angeles, and I, I saw someone in the chat as well, was asking about exterior water sprinklers. And um, I wanted to, 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 to throw this question over uh, to, to one or other of you. Maybe this is a, more a question for Steve, but can you give us your thoughts on, on, on the self-help that folks ought to do with regards to sprinklers? You know, when it comes to, you know, do, do you represent, sorry, do, do, you, do you recommend on like rooftop sprinkler system like the, the Joe mentions? What, what, how do you think people ought to be thinking about their installation of sprinklers? Yeah, I think the um, the first thing is that uh, do everything you can do to your house first, um, because when you retrofit your structure on the exterior components and materials um, to a higher, uh, you know, ignition resistant or non combustible, they're always in place and they're always working. Um, we we understand that that sprinklers are a hot topic. Uh, we think they have promise. But there's a lot of things that need to go right in order for a sprinkler system to work. Um, you have to have a good water supply that doesn't shut off. Um, right. Because uh, we have frequently in many fires lost water supply to the area. So you, it has to have its own independent water supply, electrical or power of some sort. Um, power is always going to go out in a wildfire. Um, so it has to be able to be uh, maintained over time and work when you need it to work. So we think they have promise. Um, we just don't think they're quite there yet. Uh, interior sprinklers went through thousands upon thousands of hours to test and get them right and uh, test standards and maintenance and stuff. External sprinklers have not, uh, haven't have gone through any of that. So they do have promise. We say focus on the structure itself, retrofitting the exterior um, components with a higher level of material. Um, and then if you want to do more after you've already done that, then you can look at um, external sprinklers. Okay. Um, let me, uh, William from LA in advance uh, a question, asked us a question about fire retardants and the appropriateness of spring fire retardants like FOSS check uh, along roadsides and under power lines to make them more fire resistant. Talk to us about, about these fire retardants. Yeah, so they um, some of them proven to do a really uh, effective job at um, preventing the spread of a fire. Um, we use them during our fire suppression um, on fire engines and um, and our air tankers. Um, however, they have a limited application. Um, we have thousands upon thousands of miles of roadway and electrical infrastructure throughout California, and we can't be spraying underneath our long. Uh, uh, electrical power lines or along roadways all throughout California. And embers, as I say, are pretty prevalent in a wildfire. So embers can just travel over top of them potentially and 
start a fire on the other side and continue on going. So they do have a, a, a place in the toolbox. Um, it's just not the only um, tool in the toolbox. Right. Okay. Um, I mean, what do, do you have? Do, are, what, what's the status of, of? Do you have a situation where people are are where re residents themselves are somehow obtaining these fire returns and spraying them on their own properties? Do you, do you see that happen sometimes? I have uh, heard about it more so spraying on the exterior siding and um, of the structure itself, not so much on the vegetation. Um, but uh, IVHS uh, that I've talked about did a lot of research in this area. And they found that uh, these um, uh, treatments don't weather well uh, and last up over time. So right. you can, um, uh, you know, put it on today. In a, within six months, the effectiveness um, has significantly downgraded. So really, again, we we say, you know, take a look at the structure, see what you can do to replace components that are more uh, vulnerable to embers and fire. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Um, there was a question in the chat about, um, you know, and there's actually, been, I've, I've been noticing a lot of things popping up about assessments. So um, in your experience, uh, I, either of you, you know, maybe, maybe this is more for Steve, but, but, but certainly Mike, just weigh in on whatever you want to. Um, how good are homeowners in conducting a self-assessment of their homes in terms of resilience, like dispensable space? Or, or is it, you know, is it, it doesn't seem like most of this is rocket science, but then again, you know, lay people don't always pick up on the same things that a, that a fire professional might. Let me ask yeah, you. Mike, would you like to take that one? Well, on, on our side, we are, are talking to several different uh, technological uh, developers who are looking at different programs for homeowners to be able to not only do assessments, but actually document their assessment through photograph and through uh, basically being able to collect and capture the, the work that they're doing around their homes to be able to share with their insurance companies. Uh, a lot of that's still in development and, and we really don't have anything specific, but uh, back at, at, at you know, I, I think it's important for homeowners to, uh, as they have skin in the game, it's important for them to ultimately uh, have that ownership of, of doing the, the hard work to get their homes, uh, you know, really fire safe. Uh, to be able to document and have that record is, is extremely important. So we're continuing to, to work with those developers to kind of advise how we think they should be able to uh, improve those programs. And, and back to Chief Hawks. Yeah, I think there, you know, the awareness level is certainly on the increase with the amount of fire activity, as you referenced to, to start out the uh, webinar today. Um, but there's a lot more that needs to go on. There's certainly the uh, defensible space has been around for decades. Um, and I think the awareness around defensible space is getting there. Yeah. Um, uh, but home retrofitting is a newer topic. And there's still a lot that we, um, our research that's being done in this area needs to be done. And so, um, you know, it's not necessarily the exterior siding that could bring your house down. It could be a little something very small and seemingly insignificant that it just takes one of those embers to find that spot um, to catch something on fire to bring the house down. So, um, yeah, I think we're getting there, but we have a lot uh, more to do. Yeah. Um you know, I I, uh, I I saw this question here from um, Marcel. Many homeowners don't want to remove the shrubs against their house. Sometimes the HOA even specifically disallows it. How would you respond to this trend? I mean, you know, people, 99.9% .9 of the time, there's no fire problem. They want their house to look nice. They've got, sometimes they've got really good plants around their house. Talk to us about this challenge. Yeah, that's a significant uh... Uh, thing that we're going to have to cross here pretty soon. The, the zero to five foot zone, the regulation is being worked on by the Board of Forestry. So it's a little premature to say exactly uh, what that is going to look like. Um, but once it's developed, um, you know, we're going to have to roll that out and work with property owners to make sure that they understand the requirements of the law. And it, it, it will be in the law. So a homeowners association, uh, you know, requirements aren't going to um, overtake what is required in the law. Um, right. So we just have to make sure that people understand that that zone is a critical zone, that the research has shown it to be the most critical zone for defensible 
space, that's where embers can really get a hold of flammable material, as you saw in that video, and take that fire directly to the house. And we, we don't want that to occur, obviously. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, it, it's just education <laughs> and, and then understanding, too, that um, you, know, you can have a really attractive yard and beautiful landscape and still be fire, um, fire resilient. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and what's, is, what's the best, what is the best single brochure or website or source? I mean, a bunch of things have been posted for people to think when they're thinking about their landscaping, what, which one would you really direct people to, to read and, and internalize if they're really thinking about, about fire sensitive landscaping? Yeah, I think there's some good, um, out, good ones out there. They're ready for wildfire. The fire safe council's website is another really good one. Um, okay. University of California, Cooperative Extension has a lot of good um, research and papers in this area. I know I you asked for one, but um, yep. that there's several out there. There's that are really good. That's helpful. Okay, we've got a couple. So Clyde, and then uh, at the you know, and then um, uh, I'm seeing uh, Shayla. Um, bo both were asking kind of tenant related questions. Do either of you? Maybe this is more a question for you, Mike. But um, what, what? So if if you don't own your own home, right? let's say you're a tenant. What sort of, um, you know, are, are any recommendations for apartment dwellers or are we at the mercy of building management? Uh, you know, Clyde's question, similar. What can tenants do to make their buildings more fire safe? Are landlords required to implement certain fire safety measures? Uh, what, what, what advice do you give to tenants who might be concerned about a fire safety? Thank you, thank you Senator. I, I think one of the things a, 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 an apartment tenant can do is, is, again, work with establishing a fire safe council in their community, maybe in just their apartment complex. Uh, you know, there's there's no required number of folks, but if you get enough interested folks together to be able to be a voice working with those community leaders and so on, I think that voice is going to encourage the apartment or property owners to uh, abide by those those you know suggestions and those rules that are out there to make their their uh, their building safe and their and their tenants safe. Uh, we do see oftentimes in, in those uh, apartment type environments that uh, people stash uh, a lot of fuel load within their own uh, apartment complex, uh, little uh, entryways and in and, uh, and, and the, the areas that go out uh, in their backyards. And, and again, working, working to educate those folks, talking to your neighbors, getting people involved, sharing the brochures that we have available on our site, and, and just talking about making your, your building safe and your, your home safe. I mean, I, I think that's our goal. So uh, getting that, that uh, committed community voice together as a, as a fire safe council, I think is one, one action you can take. Um, you know, Shayla asked another question. I, is, is on, you know, I think it's on the mind of a lot of folks. I mean, there are, the, the people who live, you know, uh, right up in the mountains, there's no question they're, they're, they're typically in very high fire risk zones. But Shayla says, you know, she lives so two blocks south of where the Hollywood Hills get hilly. Now, there's a lot of people in my district who are not right in the fire zone, but are in a more urban area, but close to uh, a more, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, hilly, uh, you know, fire prone area. And of course, you know, all you all one had to do is look at those awful uh, photographs of Santa Rosa. I mean, paradise was one thing I was in the middle of the forest, but Santa Rosa, you would have thought would be a more uh, suburban um you know, less fire prone area. And yet you saw whole neighborhoods that were wiped out during that terrible fire a few years back. So how much do the people of, let's say Hollywood, for example, have to fear uh, or, or, or have to prepare for these kinds of challenges? Not obviously the folks in the Hollywood Hills, that's one thing, but the people who may be in the, the flatlands, but close to the hills. I don't know how well, how familiar you are with LA geography, but, but can, you, can you speak a little bit to, to that sort of concern? Yeah, I think your example of the Tubbs Fire and Coffee Park is a, is the really the perfect example. Um, you know, the fire came over from Napa County, uh, burned through many different areas, and then jumped a six lane highway, Highway 101, to get into the coffee park area because of embers. And uh, you know, once the fire got established in some structures due to the high density of the uh, housing in that area with the significant wind that was blowing, it, it really went structure to structure and, and ceased, in essence, ceased to be a wildland fire in that coffee park area and just became an urban conflagration. So um, the threat is definitely real. 
Um, but fortunately, you know, there's things that we can do to prepare for that. And that's uh, home hardening, building to chapter 7A, defensible space, all things that occur on the parcel level that we as property owners have some control over. Um, and albeit, um, there's a lot of things that can be done and could be very costly. And that's some of the, the programs that um, Mike talked about that are being rolled out is to provide those assistance to um, property owners that need that. So, so Mike, can you talk to the folks that are living in a more urban setting? Is it the same rules of home hardening? I, I presumably not, right? I mean, you know, the, I, you know, Senator, it really is. And, and I'll use the example of uh, Lassen County, the Dixie fire this year, this last year, um, fire behavior, fire was spotting four miles ahead of the main fire. And that's very unusual, uh, you know, but in a wind driven fire that can happen. We see a lot of the same topography and a lot of the same geographic type uh, areas uh, on the wild wildland side in Southern California that we see up, up in the high desert up north. And if it's going to happen up there, it's going to happen down in the south, too. So be prepared throughout the community, including the in, inside of those urban areas, because thinking about it, and, and I think people, if, if they get a, a basic understanding of fire science, the ignition component, if you if you take a receptive fuel bed and that's, you know, your your little area right next to the apartment complex, for example, where you have some uh, brush or, 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 you know, your or your plants growing there and you take 100 lit matches and you throw them on the ground. How many of those matches are going to are going to ignite is the ignition component, you know, discussion. And if one of those ignites, that's all it takes. And that that spot fire that could potentially be pushed through, a, you know, during a wind driven fire could absolutely ignite homes. And, and like you like you mentioned in, in Santa Rosa, you know, as, as a as a responder who who was in, in route to to the Kmart parking lot to, to meet up in the stage of that area and to arrive and see a, a parking lot that had nothing in it because the the you know the structure there was was fully engulfed it was burning you have to be aware that this is going to happen anywhere in California it's going to happen anywhere throughout the western United States now we're seeing increased patterns of this changing fire behavior going going farther east and farther north and farther south so as that continues to happen please you know Think of it as if you live in a community, everybody needs to take those same preventative measures. And just to add on wow. to that, um, we all need to be prepared and work together. We can't just have one home doing the right thing or a few here and there. We all need to do this together. Sobering. I mean, and by, and by the way, I just want to I want to think you, know, you guys are actually answering questions verbally and in the chat somehow in real time. So I, I just want to also thank you for your dexterity. We're obviously not going to be able to answer every single question on this, but I, I really appreciate um, your thoughtful answers, the two of you, on, both both uh, verbal and, and, and on the chat. Um, you know, we got a question from Rob from Idlewild. I don't, I don't know how you've heard about this, but that's great. Um, certainly a, a fire prone area. Rob says, uh, I've heard two different views about hardening the space where an exterior wall meets the porch deck. That's where embers can get in. And then in contrast, that's not a concern. What's your perspective and what's needed? Love you to answer that. And then we've also had a couple of questions about fire retardant paint for decks and outside of the home on the chat too. So so um, hardening, so different views on hardening the space where an exterior wall meets the porch deck. And also would love your thoughts on fire retardant paint on decks and on the outside. Maybe go to you, Steve. Okay, so the... Um, siding deck issue, that intersection between the two, um, the, the vulnerability is the, the fire starting on the deck and progressing to the structure. Now, if you have a structure that has uh, combustible siding, obviously not a good combination. So um, what uh, Chapter 7A uh, requires for new construction and what we're saying for retrofitting is to um, put a flashing or something non-flammable uh, up six inches um, on the siding from the deck to kind of helpfully break that chain of the fire progressing and catching the structure as well as that that's going to be an accumulation of point for embers during a fire so we don't we really want to protect that joint there that intersection between the the deck and the wall mm -hmm. okay what about this question about is there, is there some types of plants or trees that just drive you guys crazy it's like why that, that people just should absolutely not be planting this day and age uh, you know, given their, their flammability. Steve. Uh, sure. So uh, yeah. Uh, eucalyptus uh, is a big one. Uh, juniper plants, um, Italian cypress. Um, 
palm trees seem to have an affinity for embers to catch them and then um, they go up uh, and, and you know continue to cast uh, embers uh, downstream or downwind. But uh, uh, really, you know, anything that's going to be as it matures gets woody kind of underneath and has a tendency to to accumulate um, old debris, needles or leaves um, within the plant itself. Um, those are going to be ones that you know should look at maybe replacing or at least provide good maintenance for them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have so many great questions here. Unfortunately, we're just not going to be able to get to everyone. I, I, you know, Wendy Sue talks about how we shouldn't be incentivizing more housing in very high fire hazard severity zones. Couldn't agree more. Uh, and that's certainly something that Henry Stern and I have been working on. Um, you know, struggling to get some of our colleagues to see see the, the wisdom of that, unfortunately. But but from my perspective, it's so obvious. Um, Dorothy was asking a little bit about wells. I mean, this kind of gets this. This ties in with the, the sprinkler question. I know, uh, you know, one of the challenges, I guess, is that there's some water agencies that are reluctant for, uh, especially given the, the the groundwater rules. Have you run into any challenges with with homeowners that want to dig wells, but they're getting pushback from local authorities that, uh, uh, you know, that b because of, of of how it might impact uh, groundwater sources, so that people can, but people want to dig the well so they can have a water source that could be used to fight a fire. Has that has that ever come up around the state? Stephen, to, to your knowledge, or Mike? No, not, not to my knowledge, Mike. I was, no, not not I'm aware of, but I, you know, there, there's definitely some concerns with some of the smaller municipal water companies that that are dealing with uh, water systems. I know in a in a fire back in 2014, and, and it's it's happened several times since then. You know, when a, when a fire happens, you got multiple community members then going out to set their own personal sprinklers up or start trying to protect their homes, turning their water on or not shutting their water off when they evacuate. When their homes burn down, you have an open water source that continues to run and the fire suppression, uh, it, you know, trying to draw water from the system sucks the system dry. And that's that's very difficult. So right. as we teach home assessment, for example, I, I often tell people if you know when the question gets asked, well, should I shut my water off when I evacuate my home? If you live on a water system, I recommend it. If you live on a on your own uh, system for your own uh, well and your own water, then then go ahead and give it a shot. I mean, you're you're probably not going to drain an entire aquifer, hopefully, but if it may assist in the protection of your home. Other other folks, and we just mentioned, if you have a swimming pool, you know, keep that available for fire suppression. And sometimes people have floatal pumps that they'll go out and start uh, operating and using their their water from their pool system to to basically create a sprinkler system around their home. So there's some things that can be done. But, uh, but yeah, nothing's come up so far. Okay. Um, Maureen asked a question about baffling vents for addicts. Thoughts on that, Steve? Yeah, so um, the current standard for um, vents is what we call a wooey vent or flame and ember resistant vent. So uh, there's th three basic manufacturers that sell these compliant vents in California. And um, they all, basically they just have to meet the test standard and they have different ways of bringing their vents into compliance with that standard. Um, so they may use a baffle, but either way, I think if, if you're looking at, um, you know, replacing vents, then um, you should look at uh, the new uh, wildland urban interface um, buoy vents for flame and amber resistance. Okay. Um, and then interesting, I, I, we, gotta, we gotta wrap up, but um, Spencer has an interesting question. You know, there's so many, uh, products out there. I mean, lots of people who market directly to people who are concerned about fire safety, and it's only going to get, you know, it, we all know as fire season will continues to grow, vulnerability continues to grow, the capitalist machine's going to kick into gear and everyone and their mother's going to be getting mailers every day and calls about the latest and latest new, new technology that's going to help save their home. How should I mean, is there is there a good consumer reports or so? I mean, how, how do how should regular folks, uh, 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 you know, be able to evaluate all of these claims coming at them from private sector entities, some of whom have really great innovative products, um, when they're trying to make decisions? I mean, is, is there is there some sort of like testing system? I know there's some testing up in Montana. You know, what we're, how should people what what should people use to guide them when it comes to to evaluating? fire uh, 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 protection products that are being sold toward them? Yeah, that's uh, definitely a, a big thing to be concerned about there. Like you mentioned, a lot of 
things are coming out of the woodwork, um, external sprinklers, wrapping of homes. We saw in the Caldor fire, um, the paint, the painting of homes or, or applying a topical um, retardant to the exterior of a home. So um, we uh, have uh, within the Office of the State Fire Marshal on our website, a building materials listing program. And so we list um, products and vendors that supply um, materials that are compliant with Chapter 7A. So if you're looking to uh, make sure that you purchase something, whether it's exterior siding or um, vents, uh, for example, you can go to our website and I'll supply that um, link here uh, and, and check out our list and um, see if you can find something there. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of things out there. So just be careful about what you what you purchase. Yeah. Mike, any, any, any thoughts on that or? No, I, I think that was a great suggestion. Okay. All right. Guys, I, I just can't help but I, I, I'm so appreciative uh, to both of you for, for, for taking this time, for answering all of these questions. Uh, we know there are so many more out there. And uh, you know, this is just one little piece of a broad effort to try to make sure that our residents, our fellow Californians have the information they need to, to make sure that their homes are, are safe or safer. Uh, as we as we move into this new era, where unfortunately wildfires are an increasingly uh, you know, a prevalent part of our of our life here in the state of California, so thank you for doing this. Thank you for your thoughtful, comprehensive answers. Thank you for all the material that you've posted in our chat. We are going to post this video online, so if there's any uh, anything you want to go back to and listen to, uh, we'll also have some information on that uh, link. That will uh, that will um, uh, will we'll have uh, uh, you know various various resources that people can turn to, including many of the ones that have been addressed and, and brought up today, so that you can go and follow up and learn more about all the various things that that Mike and and, and Steve have been talking about. Uh, Post it on your screen right now. Our email address, our phone number as well. So if, if you're having any trouble tracking down in our link, or you want to be able to do some follow up uh, with some of the fire authorities, we'd be happy to to put you in contact. Uh, but I just want to thank everybody. I want to thank Davis, especially uh, Davis Hahn from my staff for working so hard to help to pull this together. Thank you uh, to everyone for, for jumping on. Please let them know that this is going to be posted on our website uh, for people to view. So if, if any of your friends or neighbors were not able to, to join us live, uh, hopefully they, they, they may find it, uh, it worth their time to, to log on and, and, and listen to our presentation. Thank you, everyone. Have a very great evening and stay safe. Thank, thank you, Senator. Senator. Thanks for the opportunity. Take care, everybody. Thanks, guys.